You know what they say, lightning never strikes the same place twice, except that it does. Those things are called lightning rods. Also, lightning happens to strike rockets all the time. So once, lightning struck Apollo 12 as it was lifting off from the launch platform, and it struck it, and it went down to the ground, and then scientists and researchers at NASA did a study to determine what was going on, why did lightning strike a rocket? And what they found was that the rocket is a very good conductor. It's made out of mostly metal, and as it moves through the atmosphere, some of the clouds and weather systems it moves through can be electrically charged, have electric differentials, and when it moves through that path of possible electricity, it creates a path path of least resistance in the form of its metal body, but also the plume of exhaust that it creates. It creates an electrically advantageous way for uh, that charge difference to equalize itself in. And that's what happened, or so they think. And we know this for sure, because just a few days ago, literally, lightning struck a Soyuz rocket, as you can see happening right here. And if we freeze, the frame at the exact right time, we can actually see the lightning traveling through the body of the rocket and down through the exhaust plume. That's why I like science. It's like clickbait that uh, makes sense. <laughs> Does the lightning actually strike, strike rockets? The second answer may shock you. Welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, and I launch a bunch of sciencey stuff at them, like a rocket heading into a lightning storm. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's one of my favorite kinds of questions that we ask on this channel, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with this character, but it's kind of like, can Wolverine get a tattoo? But getting right into it in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out if the flying monsters in the Godzilla MonsterVerse are actually big enough. Specifically, we were wondering if their wingspans were large enough according to known scaling laws in nature that we looked up and referenced in the episode. I said that these flying monsters need to be at least this big. <laughs> And look, look at how much bigger they are than Godzilla. And you do not see them like that in the movie, so make them bigger and then let them flight. <laughs> but what did you have to say? First comment comes from King Life Drain, Eden in the East, and others who say that King Ghidorah has not only uh, gravity manipulation abilities, but he's also a space dragon! Does that make his wing size, or at least the power that he needs to supply to those wings to get him off the ground, does that make a little bit more sense if he's not from Earth? Well, that's hard to say. I was referencing if he was an alien, which he is. If he was an alien, it might be more plausible because it has nothing to do with gravity or our atmosphere. I was just saying if he evolved under a separate set of conditions on a different planet that forced his physiology to be different, more robust, have more energetic muscles, that kind of thing. If it had different biology from what we know on Earth, then maybe it could be plausible, it could not be plausible. I did not mean that our atmosphere would make it more or less advantageous for a giant flyer like that, but we'll get into that in some corrections. Skade Lapers, Carlos Silvera, uh, and others say, great video, Kyle. Using the same kind of scaling in this episode, though, could we apply it to Game of Thrones? How big would Drogon's wingspan have to be? All right, fine, challenge accepted. Let's get technical. I'll do some math. Using the same scaling relationship that uh, we used in the flight and scaling of flyers paper that is in the show notes for the episode, I use that scaling with the mass that I'm assuming Drogon to be. I'm gonna assume that it's roughly T-Rex mass, because it's about T-Rex length. And if we use that scaling relationship, we get a wingspan of 65 meters, which is the football field, 100 meters long. You can kind of envision that. It's about 210 feet wide. Now, very interestingly, let's go to the producers of Game of Thrones for the largest dragon sizes that they had. And they say, quote, the dragons this year are the size of 747s. The Boeing 747 is 230 feet long and has a wingspan of, guess what? Exactly 65 meters. I'm not joking. Their wingspan that they're referencing is 210 feet. What I just calculated, knowing nothing about what they're basing it on and choosing a random mass, I get 210 feet exactly, 0% difference. So A, that's amazing, and I love when math works out like that. B, it's interesting that they might be pretty close to what a wingspan should actually be like. However, all that being said, could a Drogon actually fly with wings like a 747. Well, the reason that a 747's wings can be that size is because it has engines 
engines with a lot of power coming out of it, and it can keep a lot of people, a lot of machinery aloft. If those wings had to flap, that wing area would have to increase substantially. So for Drogon, if he is flapping, then it would require a larger wings in this, more muscle, which adds more weight, which means you need larger wings and so on and so forth. And it's, it's this runaway positive feedback loop where the wings get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what nature has done is kind of isolated the maximum size, say eh, 10 kilograms, not 10,000 in that kind of way. But the math working out is kind of amazing. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Sid, Lord of the Flame says, okay, but how does Godzilla stack up to your measurements? And would your final conclusion give him any disadvantage? Maybe also big fan. <laughs> well, Godzilla is a different case because we do not have a scaling factor for something like a wingspan, what he would actually need to get off of the ground. If anything, we have to scale down Godzilla because for what we know about how biology works on this planet, if he has normal bones, bones of similar material to us, as he scales up, his volume gets a lot bigger and therefore a lot heavier. That gets larger faster than the cross-sectional area of his bones and muscles, which determines its strength and its ability to hold mass, his weight. So if that's the case, biology as we know it doesn't allow for animals to be even close to 100 meters tall or whatever. So just for his circulatory system, how big his heart would have to be, his legs would have to be so wide he probably wouldn't be able to move. I mean, you can see how wide elephant's legs are in comparison to something like a mouse. His biology would be so ridiculous, he probably would just die under his own weight. That's why you only find animals that are so large, like the blue whale, in water, because they have a buoyant force holding them up, and they do not have to move against as much of their own weight, as you can see when whales, unfortunately, beach themselves or something like that. They're kind of immobile after that, and that's what would happen to Godzilla, I think. Travis Mertland says, I see an important failure to include a Star Wars reference when you said, quote, X wingspan. Boo! Nice. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this video, I'm giving to Dalton Inge, or Inge, or what do you want from me? <laughs> I can't pronounce anything, as you know. Who says, I would also like to point out that at the scale of 3,000 meters, if one wingtip had to flap one time every four seconds, the the twing, the twing tip would travel at roughly over 2,000 miles per hour, assuming the, the wing angle. So that would also potentially be creating sonic booms every time Ghidorah flapped its wings, and then he does the hands up emoji, but it actually looks like a wing flapping emoji that a person's doing. So A plus for that. So I don't know your exact math, how you exactly modeled the wing and how it's moving, but yes, the wing tip, relatively speaking, would have to cover a lot of distance in just a little bit of time, and this would be indeed supersonic speeds, which is around 700 miles per hour. Your value is over three times that, so like Mach 3. So would it create sonic booms at the wingtip? Possibly. That's what a whip does. Possibly the first sonic boom ever created by anything made by uh, humans. The end of a whip cracks so quickly that it breaks the sound barrier, so the wingtips of Ghidorah could also break the sound barrier, and you'd be correct. And for pointing all of this out, uh, Dalton, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Oh, did you hear that crack? Gotta work on my flight mus. But of course, I'm not always right. Apparently, I can pronounce almost nothing correctly. Okay, so kind of a serious first correction here uh, that comes from Nerds Talk, D uh, TM Delacrush, Jonathan Wisner, who all say that it seems like giant flyers in Godzilla would fall into the realm of bumblebee flight. And they all bring up the point that bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly, that they are aerodynamically unable, thanks to physics, to fly, and they shouldn't be able to fly. Now, you've probably heard this said somewhere, and we can get into the origins of it in a second, but what I want to say is at this point specifically, even if you all did not mean it this way, and you're just repeating something you heard in pop culture, this is often used in support of pseudoscience, creationism, things that go against the scientific worldview as we know it. As we understand the world, this kind of statement doesn't make sense. No matter what we say, Bumblebees fly is point one. And point two, this actually originated uh, apocryphally, maybe, uh, when it was said by a French entomologist, Antoine Magan, in 1934, based on calculations by his assistant and engineer. So you could see where if we were to, for example, make wing-based calculations for something like a Rodan and say it can't fly based on that, and then we see an animal doing that in nature. So this has gone on to be kind 
kind of a talking point where you use the fact that somebody said once that bumblebees can't fly according to physics, and then you take that and you say, well then what does science really know? They don't even know how bumblebees fly. How can science be right? What I want to point out very clearly is that bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly if they were to fly like planes. Sure, but they can and do fly. They beat their wings many, many times per second. They are incredible little engines of evolution uh, going about their little lives and buzzing about and they're, and they're lovely. And we do know insect wing physics pretty well. They are very big and bumbly and a little bit uh, kind of like furry chonky and I love them. But they can, of course, fly because they do. What's important to remember here is that evolution doesn't care with what's optimal. Could there be a perfect wing size for a bumblebee that it would work like our planes work? Yes, of course, but evolution doesn't care about that. It only cares about what works based on current environmental pressures. Bumblebee wings are probably very inefficient, but because it does work for their lives to pass along their genes at some regular interval, it just works. Not everything has to be perfect, it just has to work. And as long as it works, it's not contradicted by physics or anything that we know about it. So I just wanted to point out that in case any of you are getting a kind of a, you know, young earthy kind of creationist bent here, it's not true, it's never been true. And it will never be true because You know. Second correction comes from Adriano Bueno, who says, just leaving this here, the Quetzalcoatl is an outlier in these equations. It was much larger than the largest bird that we said could fly, which is around uh, 10 kilograms in our graphs, but there are estimates of the Quetzalcoatlus to be almost up to like 500 kilograms. What's the reason for that? Well, Adriano says, uh, they could be much bigger and heavier than current flying animals because Earth's atmosphere had a different chemical composition back in those times. Air pressure was much lower Lower, so the drag caused by a flying creature was also lower. N none, of, none of that's correct. The Earth's atmosphere has gone through many different uh, compositions and uh, levels of different gases in it over the 200 million years that pterosaurs were around, but it wasn't that dissimilar to the air that we have today. But to your point, scientists and researchers, it's still an open question for them on how exactly an animal so big as the Quetzalcoatlus actually fly. Did it run off of cliffs instead of lifting itself off of the ground to mostly glide, catch thermals, and uh, kind of drift that way like a large albatross? How did it fly? Did it actually flap that hard? That's an open question because we only have fossils. The fossils that we've found show they had very hollow bones, so they probably did something like flying, like the other birds that we know of did. However, Earth's atmosphere has not changed so drastically over the timeline we're considering here that animals that are half a ton could fly easily, but couldn't today. We haven't gone from hyper-dense atmosphere like gas giant atmosphere to not in that period of time. So you get at an interesting side point that we don't know everything about these amazing creatures, but what you're saying specifically is not right. Kyrios Mirage says, cool episode. Slight correction on uh, Gojira's scaling. The king was 50 meters tall in his debut in 1954 and is now about 120 meters tall. That's about two and a half times more, more than the 60% you, men you mentioned in the opening 10 seconds of your episode. Keep up the great work. Yep. I really beefed this one. I said 60%. 60% of 50 is a little bit more than 50% of 50, which would make it around 80 meters. And he's not 80 meters tall. He's over 100 meters tall now, which means it's at least over 100% increase. So at the very start of that episode, we were wrong. Thank you. Can't do anything about it now, except own up to it. By far, the most corrections are about this from uh, Diziz Danny and King Tokyo Godzilla, who I think has a lot to say. And I even got an email from Christine. Perfect. I got like two emails in the last 30 minutes about I'm pronouncing King Ghidorah wrong. I will admit that I probably mixed up the pronunciations at some point during the episode, and that's just because I speak very, very quickly, and I have to get things done fast. But I will point out that in the episode, I did pronounce the king correctly. So let's hear just the correct pronunciation of Ghidorah here for a second. That sounds like a Ghidra to me. So let's uh, go back to uh, last week's episode. There's in the monster verse like Ghidorah. Hmm. Don't those two things sound similar? <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so I'm sorry if I potentially offended anyone uh, for not giving proper credit to the original Japanese pronunciation. Uh, I'm obviously not a Japanese person and I don't know how to say all Japanese words correctly, so I did my best. Gitara is what I thought it was and I thought I said that and all of you thought I was wrong, so. But by far the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Luke Kaiser, who has actually a fantastic suggestion. Hold on, what if Ghidorah, Mothra, and Rodan were nuclear powered? So we know that in the modern Godzilla films, nuclear radiation has a lot to do with these creatures and their powers and stuff like that. Would it be at all feasible for such creatures to sort of supercharge their muscles, Luke says, with some form of nuclear power, like boiling water in their stomachs with massive amounts of radiation and pumping steam through artery-like tubes in their muscles? What if the monsters of Godzilla developed nuclear power hundreds of years before we did? That's a fascinating suggestion. So if, let's say, all of these creatures have something to do with nuclear energy. Now, nuclear radiation does not play very well with biological material. What it does mostly is destroy it, cause DNA mutations, rip electrons from atoms and molecules, cause a lot of potential damage, which is not good if you're a thing that wants to live. I do not know of any organism that takes advantage of radiation in the way that you are suggesting. So could an ancient creature, an alien creature do it? I don't know, maybe, but I want to take your suggestion a different way. You're right that a lot of radioactive material, when it's together, can get so hot that it can just vaporize water. That's why we cover nuclear reactors in water to keep it cool. And that's also why when Chernobyl failed, if you're watching the HBO documentary, the core got so hot without adequate cooling that it caused an instantaneous steam explosion. When the core got so hot, so radioactive, undergoing criticality, that water that touched it instantly vaporized into steam and blew apart the building, throwing radiation everywhere. Some kind of explosion throwing radiation everywhere in a directed kind of way. Does that sound like anything you know Godzilla can do? What if Godzilla's atomic breath isn't like a fire breath like a Drogon would have, but instead his radioactive body or his core or what have you has so much nuclear radiation going around it, and you'll see in the new movie just how much radiation he can output, but he has so much radiation in his body and he spends so much time in the ocean that what if he just always has a lot of water, say, waiting around in a, in a biological sack or in, even in his stomach, like you suggest, and then at will, he can make it so hot that it flash vaporizes to steam, takes some of those radioactive particles with it up through his esophagus, out of his mouth in a directed way, kind of like a Chernobyl steam explosion, and that is his atomic breath. That works out almost perfectly, and it is the explanation I'm gonna use for his atomic breath going forward, and it's all thanks to you, Luke, for making me think about this, so you are indeed a super nerd. Ha! And now, moving right along to this week's episode of Because Science. This week's episode is, can you burn Ant-Man? with a magnifying glass? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are taking what I like to call a second tier question. We take something we know about a pop culture thing, something we know about a science thing, and we put it together in an interesting way, like can Wolverine get a tattoo? Can you burn Ant-Man with a magnifying glass? We know that magnifying glasses can concentrate the sun's power enough to burn things, even ants, if you're a kid filled with regret, you know that. And we know Ant-Man can shrink down to literally the size of an ant. So what would happen? The answer, might shock you. Oh, man. Mm. Nice. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet all about Godzilla and how big its flying monsters should actually be. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget, there are three cardinal rules for improv. One, keep talking. Two, Yes, and, and three, don't make a joke about guns.